Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the inaugural Unwokable podcast. I am your host, Unwokable. This podcast will focus on local issues concerning critical race theory, critical theory, and how these ideologies are practiced on your students in schools and other institutions through what I call the visions of ideological enforcement or commonly known as Offices of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, or DEI. In today's episode, we will address two claims made by State Representative Jacob Rosencrantz. One, that DEI has nothing to do with critical race theory. And two, that critical race theory is not being practiced on students in Oklahoma public schools. Oklahoma, your officials are lying to you. They're lying to you. And they're doing so by insisting that you're stupid. They believe, like Jacob Rosencrantz here, that you cannot see or understand the correlation of ideology and content if they just change the name of the same subject matter and same belief principles and same content from one to the other. Well, critical race theory isn't DEI. DEI isn't critical race theory. Ibram Kendi is preaching anti-racism, not critical race theory. Well, I intend to prove to you today by using Norman Public Schools Teaching for Equity Teacher Training Program presented by Norman Public Schools Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Office that the the only reason for the existence of that office is to implant, embed in everything that your teachers do critical race theory ideology. I will prove that to you today using their own words and their own trainings. So let's begin with Representative Jacob Rosencrantz, who represents Norman, Oklahoma. He retweets a tweet from NBC News, and here's how that news story reads from NBC. A new controversial bill in the Oklahoma State Legislature will limit how slavery is taught in schools and ban teaching that one race is the unique oppressor or victim in slavery. I'm already suspicious of this bill in just reading the story. Now you've got to take into account that NBC will twist the framing of things, but it seems redundant. I don't know who Representative Olson is, but I know that none of the representatives who wrote and supported House Bill 1775 signed on to this bill. Because what House Bill 1775 does is make it makes it illegal for teachers to insist that students today are unique oppressors or unique victims based upon the color of their skin and how that relates to the history of their ancestors. So it's already redundant. I don't understand why Representative Olson brought forward this bill. So that makes me suspicious, especially considering how Jacob Rosencrantz here is going to use it. So Jacob says in his tweet retweeting the NBC News story, Oh, nice. We made the national news, and the we is Oklahoma. Not teaching all of history is the epitome of indoctrination. So don't come at me with this crap, or the crap, that folk like Rep. Olson are trying to root it out of our schools. Now, if Rep. Olson's bill is really trying to limit the ability to say that, okay, in the United States, pre-Civil War, white slave owners owned black people, then I would agree. But we all know that that's not what House Bill 1775 does. 
House Bill 1775 is a civil rights bill. It says that you cannot place the sins of our ancestors on the heads of our children in the classroom today and use that to make them subservient to the will of the equity movement. You can't discriminate against kids today for the sins of their ancestors. That's 1775. But what he's also doing here is he's insisting that critical race theory, or implying that critical race theory is not in schools. So I respond, Congressman, you are being purposefully manipulative here. There's a difference between teaching and treating. The bill is poorly written, but with the charge with the change of that one word, it all makes sense. Do not conflate teaching history with treating children as historic oppressors. This is his response. And you'll often notice that the woke will do this where they'll try to correct you on something at the beginning of their arguments with you. If they choose to argue with you, most often they don't. And I'll give Representative Rosencrantz something here. He actually engaged, so um, that's refreshing. But... Um, as you can see, it doesn't end up well for him. Um, this is his response, and I quote, Respectfully, I'm a state representative. You see, the condescension. Also, this is poorly written, yes. And it's all about fear-mongering. It never needed to be written in the first place. Period. Now, I actually agree with him here. I don't see why Representative Olson brought up this bill. It seems that it's only purpose functionally is to be used by woke representatives like Jacob Rosencrantz to paint this narrative. So, but I wanted to engage him on what his opposition to House Bill 7075 and why he promotes critical race theory or insists that critical race theory isn't being taught in schools. So this was my response to him. I said, Pardon my mislabeling. I'm, I'm, I'm apologizing for his for calling him a congressman. I took the colloquial use of the federal house representative and applied it to you, sitting in the comparable state house. But then I switch back very quickly after I've genuflected to his correction um, to make him feel safe, basically. Can you answer this question? This is the question I ask him. Is critical race theory practiced in Oklahoma schools? And he responds. He says, all good, I appreciate it. And he's referring to my, my mislabeling of him as a congressman. Um, and then he says, no, CRT is not happening in our schools. I've seen some teachers slip with their political preferences, both conservative and liberal, but I never, I've never seen nor heard of the teaching of CRT nor indoctrination in our schools. Now, I respond. I say, pardon my specificity, but I asked a very specific question. Just in case it's my fault, I will be more specific. Are administrators and teachers in Oklahoma being trained to embed CRT tenants into their daily instruction and school policies. Is CRT being practiced in Oklahoma schools? This is his response, Jacob Rosencrantz. Short answer is no. Folks don't seem to know what CRT is and isn't. CRT is a college level elective for lawyers. Anecdotally, what I've seen at a district level in some schools is diversity, inclusion, and equity trainings, ideas which have, which have been weaponized as CRT. That's not CRT. So this is where we find the argument that we're going to be refuting today. In this tweet, he's saying that CRT isn't in schools and that DEI, or diversity, equity, and inclusion trainings, have nothing to do with CRT. He's playing a shell game with you. He thinks you're stupid. He thinks that you will not be able to see the correlation between content and teaching based simply upon him changing the name from CRT to DEI. 
literally what's happening here, and I'll prove it. So here's my response. I say to him, your answer implies that you know what CRT is and isn't. I understand, as named, it, it CRT, has classically been a law course using that moniker. But what does it teach? What are its tenets? What ideas does it rely on to create a law school elective course? Can those ideas, ideas be found in ed? And this is his response. He says, Jacob Rosencrantz says, and I quote, without going into too much depth on this, CRT is CRT, a college, elect, a college level elective. Trainings on diversity, equity, and inclusion and equity are just that. CRT isn't in our schools. And as an aside, the idea of large scale indoctrination in our schools is not rooted in reality either. So as you can see, he is playing a shell game with you here. And I'll prove it. He's saying that DEI, because he's changed the name, is not CRT, just to believe him, based upon his word. He knows what CRT is. You should just trust that, even though he won't explain the tenets, even though he won't give you an explanation of what it teaches. He knows for a fact that CRT is not being taught through DEI. And therefore, because there are DEI offices all throughout the state now, CRT is not being taught or trained in schools. There's one really big problem with that, though. I don't begin conversations with the likes of Jacob Rosencrantz unless I know for sure what I'm talking about. I have the receipts, Rep. Rosencrantz. I have the proof that you are wrong and that you are lying and that you're pushing a divisive agenda designed to overtake our schools, our local municipalities, our states, and our country to an ideology that is specifically designed to refute and dismantle our constitutional system. See, because I know what critical race theory is. I know what it teaches. And I'm going to show you that it is being taught in Norman, Oklahoma public schools. So this begs the question, how do I know what critical race theory is? And how do I know that it's an agenda designed to circumvent the Constitution and take over our institutions with an ideology that will put identity ahead of all other considerations? How do I know that? Well, of course, they tell us. The critical race theorists, before the likes of James Lindsay and Chris Rufo decided to shine national light on what this ideology teaches, they were very, very open in both their writing and their speaking about what exactly critical race theory is and what institutions it has been in, it has infiltrated and is designed to infiltrate. They have told us exactly what their plans are, and if all we need to do is read what they say to identify these things in the classroom, in teacher trainings, and in the, and in the federal and state government. So, I'm going to show you something right now. This is a book, a textbook, written for secondary schools and secondary school teachers called Critical Race Theory and Introduction. And in this book, it's very late, it's by Gene Stefanjek and Richard Delgado, who are uh, lead critical race theory scholars. And they're going to explain to you exactly what critical race theory is and exactly where it is in our systems. What is critical race theory? Critical race theory, CRT movement, is a collection of activists and scholars interested in studying and transforming the relationship among race, racism, and power. And power. 
the movement considers many of the same issues that conventional civil rights and ethnic studies courses take up, but places them in a broader perspective that includes economic, history, context, group, and self-interest, and even feelings and the unconscious. Here's where it gets sticky. Unlike traditional civil rights, that's MLK, which embraces incrementalism and step-by-step -step progress, critical race theory questions the very foundations of the liberal order, little l, including equality theory, that's MLK, legal reasoning, enlightenment rationalism, and the neutral principles of constitutional law. Now, here's where it bridges out. Here's where they tell you. And I quote again. Although CRT began as a movement in the law, it has rapidly spread beyond that discipline. Today, many in the field of education consider themselves critical race theorists who use CRT's ideas to understand issues of school discipline and hierarchy, tracking controversies over curriculum and history and IQ and achievement testing. Political scientists ponder voting strategies coined by critical race theorists. Ethnic studies courses often include a unit on critical race theory, and American studies departments teach material on critical white studies developed by CRT writers. Unlike some academic disciplines, critical race theory contains an activist dimension. It not only tries to understand our, our, our social situation, but to change it. It sets out not only to ascertain how our society organizes itself along racial lines and hierarchies, but to transform it for the better. So I want to take you back to this part, the part that applies to what we're talking about in terms of Jacob Rosencrantz and Norwood Public Schools. The part of this that applies here is obviously, okay, although CRT began as a movement in the law, it has rapidly spread beyond that discipline. Today, many in the field of education consider themselves critical race theorists who use CRT ideas to understand issues of school discipline. This is the part that applies to K through 12 schools, issues of school discipline and hierarchy, tracking controversies over curriculum and history and IQ and achievement testing. This is the portion that applies to DEI. The whole purpose of DEI is to take this section and apply it to these specific things. School discipline, hierarchy tracking, controversies over curriculum and history, and IQ and achievement testing. I don't know how much more plain you can get. This is DEI. This is the whole purpose of it. But I can hear you already saying, well, that doesn't mean it's in Norman, Oklahoma public school. This is Oklahoma. This is the reddest state in the country on Wokeable. There's no way. Well, there is a way. And I'm going to show you right now. So upcoming here is a snippet of an hour-long training session called Teaching for Equity from the Norman Public Schools DEI Diversity Officer, Stephanie Williams. And in it, she's going to reference Ibram X. Kendi, Mr. Anti-Racist himself. And she's going to insist, she and others will insist and have insisted that Ibram X. Kendi is not a critical race theorist. She won't say that here. She doesn't need to. This is before CRT became a national issue. But she uses him here and she uses his definition as to what your teacher should be doing to your students in their classrooms to help build equity, which means equal representation on the back end, percentage-wise, of, you know, materials and power and privilege and opportunity. So engineering that on the front end, though, requires something. It requires something very specific, something illegal. So we're going to listen here. We're going to listen to how she represents Ibram Kendi and what she wants from you and your teachers and your students 
in the classroom every single day. Now, she's going to do another sleight of hand here. They won't use the term critical race theory, so she's going to talk about social justice education. Social justice education meaning that an education designed to create equity, equity of outcome, percentage-wise, based upon the population or the identity or the color population of your school. She's also going to use the term anti-racist. This is a term coined by Ibram X. Kendi, and also the name of his 2019 National Book Award-winning book called How to Be an Anti-Racist. So you have the term social justice education, you have critical race theory in the back of your mind, you have DEI or diversity, equity, and inclusion, and now you have anti-racist. And they are going to try to convince you, or they do try to convince you, that all of these are, are different and that they have nothing in common. But I'm going to prove to you over the course of this that they do that they are exactly the same thing in terms of the way they are practiced. Because as we've seen in our last snippet of the book, that CRT has a activist component, unlike other scholarship endeavors. You must enact this ideology. And DEI by, and anti-racism is the enactment of critical race theory in our schools. Our social justice education. I have a quote here from Ibram Kendi, and it really, um, for me, sums up when we have heard and there's so much conversation about becoming anti-racist. So one either allows racial inequities to persevere as a racist or confronts racial inequities as an anti-racist. Now, I'm going to pause here for a second. It is important to understand that Ibram X. Kendi in his book, How to Be an Anti-Racist, defines being racist or anti-racist specifically in terms of policy. Now, what has policy? Institutions have policy. Cities have policy. States have policy. But more on the ground level, Schools have policy. And we can see here, this is our esteemed mayor of Norman, Mayor Bria Clark, doing her DEI training through the University of Oklahoma. And this is what she put up and what the DEI trainers at Oklahoma, at the University of Oklahoma, are teaching about how to be an anti-racist. This is what Ibram Kendi says in his book, How to Be an Anti-Racist. What is a racist policy? A racist policy is any measure that produces or sustains racial inequity between or among racial groups. Policies are written and unwritten laws, rules, procedures, processes, regulations, and guidelines that govern people. That govern people. And then he continues in his book, there is no such thing as a non-racist or race-neutral policy, or people, and this is my addition, because you are racist or non-racist based upon which policy you support. Every policy, and he continues here, every policy in every institution, in every community, in every nation, I'm going to read that again for you, okay? Every policy in every institution, like schools, in every community, like Norman, in every nation, like the United States, is producing or sustaining either racial inequity or equity between racial groups. So if there is any inequity at all between racial groups, that is because of racism and because of no other reason. It cannot be any other reason, according to DEI, according to CRT, according to anti-racism. All the same thing. That's what it is. That's what he believes. That's what he's forcing you to believe through DEI. 
And then he continues, racist policies are also expressed through other terms such as structural racism or systemic racism. Racism itself is institutional, structural, and systemic. So think about that for a minute. The reason why anybody can call you racist, the reason why the LA Times can call Larry Elder the black face of white supremacy is because they've shifted the definition of racism through critical race theory ideology by way of DEI and anti-racism, all sharing the same tenets, from the personal to the political. If you don't support redistributive policies that artificially lift up people based upon, or lift up or, or discriminate against people based upon their, the color of their skin, you are a racist. And keep in mind, I just played you a clip. I just played you a clip about how uh, how the Norman Public Schools are framing this for their teachers to teach your students. And I'm going to continue with that now. So here's Stephanie Williams again, continuing with that DEI training, teaching for equity, to teach your teachers in Norman Public Schools how to be an anti-racist. And so when you take a closer look um, at social justice education, but more specifically when we're looking at anti-racist education, again, I love um, I love graphics. So when I find really good ones, um, I, I love to use them, and this kind of this fits into that. So when we talk about becoming anti-racist, this graphic really looks at it as zones, and we've got the fear zone, the learning zone, and then we've got the growth zone. And you, you've heard me talk about growth a lot. And again, this is just another example of that's where we want to be. That's what we're striving for. Uh, perfection doesn't exist. We're going we're gonna to mess it up. But that's okay because we are, we're, we're in it and we're moving forward on the journey. And we don't want to just sit and not do anything. So if you kind of look at this graphic, I want to just pick out a piece of this and kind of talk you through it. So an example of um, the fear zone would be, I talk to others who look and think like me. But then when you go into that learning zone, that may be more of, I listen to others who think and look differently than me. And then that growth zone is I surround myself with others who think and look differently than me. I want you to take a minute, and if you've got to stop and pause the video, perfectly fine, but I want you to really kind of look at this graphic and take in some of those different pieces. Okay, so we're going we're gonna to look here. She wants us to look at the growth zone of this graphic on how to be an anti-racist. And she takes out the most innocuous part, and she talks about, well, I surround myself with people that look and think differently than me. So it, it, it must be noted here that in this graphic and in her, in her explanation that the people that you surround yourself as an anti-racist, and she's assuming she's talking to the people who disagree with her here, that have to change from the fear zone, who would be furthest away from her, right, into the growth zone, which is where she is, right, that in order to be on her team, in order to be anti-racist, in order to participate in social justice education, you have to surround yourself with people who look and think differently than you do right now. Now, she, she makes no qualification for, okay, well, if you convert everyone around you and everyone thinks and looks you know, thinks differently than you, then that's okay. Or thinks just like you, then that's okay. Um, as long as they look differently than you because you're, you know, the historically oppressor. You're the historical oppressor. But now you can be an ally, right? But what she does not go into are the other points, the other aspects of the growth zone. She tells 
the teachers who were taking this training to stop and look at the graphic. And she explains the issue about being around other people who look and think differently than you and then listening to other people, right? And then uh, eventually adopting those viewpoints. But she neglects to look at any of the rest of what's involved in being in the growth zone. And you'll see that in the, in the rest of the growth zone here on the outside, it takes anti-racist social justice education and puts it right in the pocket of public or institutional policy, which is Ibram Kendi's definition of being racist or anti-racist. You support policies that redistribute power, privilege, position, or anything else to people of the group for which he has the most affinity, right? Doesn't matter your merit, doesn't matter anything else, doesn't matter what you believe in your heart, what you think with the, what you think with your mind, what you speak with your mouth. If you do not support redistributive anti-racist policies, you are a racist because there's no racist or non-racist, remember. There's only racist and anti-racist. So he's putting you in a dichotomous trap or a Kafka trap, right? You either agree and you're an anti-racist or you don't agree and you're a racist. So we're going to take a look at the rest of the actions or beliefs that you must take in order to be an anti-racist educator. And as you'll see, it will all lead to how you enact or what you support in terms of school policy. Here we go. And this is this in order. This is what is in the growth zone. Number one, I surround myself with others, those who agree mm -hmm. with CRT, DEI, and the, and the parentheses here is me. Okay, I just want to point that out. So everything out of the parentheses is, is from the graphic. I surround myself with others who agree with CRT, DEI, or who think and look differently than me. Okay, that's the first one. That's the one she mentioned. Number two, okay, this is all going into now the things that you must do to be anti-racist that she didn't mention. Number two, I identify. When she, when she says I, this is the people she's talking to. So the teachers taking this training, right, who are mostly white, okay, or uh, a part of the historical or historically oppressive group, okay? This is number two. I identify how I unknowingly benefit from racism, capital R, as defined by Kendi and Williams here. So racism, how you unknowingly benefit from policies that they identify as racist, okay? Number three. I sit with, I sit with or internalize and accept as unquestionably right and necessary my never-ending discomfort. So, number three, you have to, first, number two is you have to know, okay, that you benefit from racist policies and that you have to sit with that discomfort and constantly let it inform your thought. Number four. I don't let my racist mistakes, as defined by Kennedy and Williams, deter me from being better or doing the work, as they often say. Number five, I speak out against, I speak out when I see racism, as defined by Kennedy and Williams, in action. That's policy, right? So any, any at all policy that may, because you can't really tell on the front end, that may lead to an equity of outcome between disparate groups based upon their the color of their skin or their identity, you must speak out against teachers, students, administrators. Okay? Number six, I educate my peers how racism harms our profession. So then it's a, it's a peer pressure issue, right? If you see it, then you must 
wield it against those who do not see it. Even if they disagree, and let them know that if they disagree, that makes them a racist. I educate my peers how racism harms our profession. Then number seven, here's the thing. I yield positions of power to those otherwise historically marginalized. So you as an ally, if you are an ally, that means you cannot be a part of the group they're a part of, right? If you're a white person, you cannot be black, right? The next step for you after you educate is you must, if you are in a position of power, you must yield your position of power to someone who thinks like you now, but does not look like you. And the last one, and this is what brings it right into Kendi, this is what brings it right into uh, what we discussed in uh, Critical Race Theory in, in Introduction. I promote and advocate for policies and leaders that are anti-racist, as defined by Kendi and Williams. So, you promote policies, that redistribute opportunity, power, resources, and positions based upon the color of someone's skin. That's what you must do in order to be an anti-racist. If you're a white person, if you're, or if you're just a person who's a part of any historically oppressive group, this is a power grab, and this is DEI. And so I'm going to take you back one thing here to, to just close the circle on this for a minute. I'm going to take you back to what critical race theory is from our critical race theory and introduction. Just to close the circle. So here we go. A reminder. What is critical race theory? Critical race theory, CRT movement, is a collection of activists and scholars interested in studying and transforming. Because remember, it has an activist component. That's DEI. That's anti-racism policy. DEI's only purpose is to enact anti-racist policy within institutions. That's it. But here, the movement is a collection of activists and scholars interested in studying and transforming the relationship among race, racism, and power. Between race, racism, and power. Now, what are... What, what, what is the, the, the boat, so to speak, for power in a school system? It is position. It's leadership positions, right? Your principal has more power in a school than your teachers do. Your teachers have more positions of power than your students. Your superintendent has more than your principals. So on and so forth. So in order to be an anti-racist, in order to be a social justice educator, you have to yield positions of power to people of marginalized groups. So the relationship among race, racism, and power. But what do you do with the people who don't agree, who won't do this for themselves, who won't give up those positions of power by themselves? Well, Ibram Kendi has the only remedy for that. And here we go. This is from the same book that she's quoting. Okay, It's the same book that Mayor Clark uses in the OUDER training. The only remedy to racist discrimination is anti-racist discrimination. The only remedy to past discrimination is present discrimination. The only remedy to present discrimination is future discrimination. That's page 19 of How to Be an Anti-Racist. The last time I checked, racial discrimination is illegal in the United States. And your administrators at Norman Public Schools, at the University of Oklahoma, and honestly at many state agencies here in the state of Oklahoma are doing this. Your federal government is doing this. They are trying to moralize racial discrimination by saying creating equity is the most important thing. It, it trumps treating people as individuals based upon their individual merit. 
And that's what you must do in order to be not racist or anti-racist. Otherwise, you, my friend, are a racist. But I can already hear in the back of my head, well, Ibram Kendi and anti-racism isn't critical race theory. Ibram Kendi says that anti-racism isn't a, even a part of critical race theory. You've heard that, whether it's from Joy Reid or from any Biden or any of the number of people who, who say things like that, that this isn't a part of what is being taught in schools. Well, again, I'm just going to come back to one I'm going to come back to the words of the people themselves. So Ibram Kendi gave an interview recently on a podcast for Slate, and this is what he says. This is him. This is Ibram Kendi, and I quote, So I've certainly been inspired by my critical race theory and critical race theorists, the way in which I formulated definitions of racism and racist and anti-racism and anti-racist have not only been based on historical sort of evidence, but also Kimberly Crenshaw's intersectionality theory, which she's one of the founding pioneers of critical race theories, theorists, who in the late 1980s and early 1990s said, you know, what, black women aren't just facing racism. They aren't just facing sexism. They are facing the intersection of racism and sexism. And that's important for us to understand that. And that's foundational to my work. So critical race theory is foundational to Ibram Kendi's work and Norman Public Schools is using his ideology, quotes from his book, through the, the, their, their offices of diversity, equity, and inclusion to implant CRT ideology in action in policy in your public schools here in Oklahoma. And I will say this over and over again, and I've said it to the governor, I've said it to several representatives. This is not a curriculum problem. This is a personnel issue. Because as long as there are offices of DEI roaming around and saying, you must do everything that you do in order to be not racist or anti-racist, you must support policies that redistribute opportunity based on race. Now, where's the explicit link between DEI and Ibram Kendi? It's actually pretty easy to find. Because Ibram Kendi, right after the George Floyd incident and he was getting millions of dollars donations from, from companies like Twitter and Amazon to support his anti his, his Center for Anti-Racism at Boston University. He wrote this. He wrote a article for The Atlantic. And in that article, he lays out clearly what the federal version of DEI is to be because this is how it functions. He says, to the original sin of racism, to fix the original sin of racism, Americans should pass an anti-racist amendment to the U.S. Constitution that enshrines two guiding anti-racist principles. Racial inequity is evidence of racist policy, and the different racial groups are equals. The amendment would make unconstitutional racial inequity over a certain threshold, or a certain percentage as well as racist ideas by public officials, as to, with racist ideas and public official clearly defined. It would establish and permanently fund the Department of Anti-Racism, or DOA, comprised of formally trained experts in, on racism and no political appointees. The DOA would be responsible for pre-clearing all local, state, and federal public policies to ensure they won't yield racial inequity, monitor those policies, investigate private racist policies when racial inequity surfaces, and monitor public officials for expressions of racist ideas. The DOA would be empowered with the disciplinary tools to wield over and against policymakers and public officials who do not voluntarily change their racist policy and ideas. 
so the Department of Anti-Racism would pre-clear any ideas for any policy. And I'm going to tell you right now, that's exactly what is happening in Norman Public Schools. That's exactly what every DEI office, whether you're talking about the one at the University of Oklahoma, you're talking about the one at the federal government, you're talking about the one in your office. Its whole system, its whole existence is only to shape the policy of an institution in order to make DEI the predominant ideology. And when I say DEI, I mean anti racism and CRT. to make it the predominant ideology in that institution. So everything is looked at first through the lens of race and whether or not you have the right or wrong skin color, whether or not you are a historically oppressive or historically victimized person. You lose your individuality. You lose your freedom. So to bring it once again full circle, I'm going to play for you the beginning of the Norman Public Schools DEI teacher training and tell me if it sounds anything to you like what the DOA is intended to be from even again. Forward. The path that we take matters. And so our commitment to e equity cannot be optional. It can't be something that we just let this person down the hall do. We can't let it be something that this, uh, this uh, um, a certain committee focuses on. It needs to be, although those are, those are all great pieces, uh, the equity conversation is one that, as Rihanna said, we need people to pull up to, and that's everyone. So... Embedding and integrating this work into everything that you do is so critical. And I want to say this, it, it's not just enough that we say we celebrate diversity. Because celebrating diversity doesn't necessarily do anything to change the inequities that exist for marginalized populations. So we want to go a step further with that. And we must ask ourselves, do we want to look better or do we want to be better? And so this training is one of many uh, supports that will be in place for you all as we take on this DEI commitment as, 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 as Norman Public Schools, as a, as a group, as a whole that's in this together. And so there it is, Norman. There it is. Embedding and integrating this work in everything that you do is so critical. The work being the work of DEI, which is a direct enforcement arm of critical race theory ideology in your public schools right now. That's what's happening. And they're doing it right under your nose. And guess what? 1775 isn't doing anything about it. Because, again, all of the teachers are trained to ingrain this in everything you do. You won't see it in standards. You won't see it in curriculum. Because it's designed to fly under the radar. You have a choice. You can let them deceive you by the shell game of names. Or you can apply your brain to what you're actually seeing. That's where we're at. So... The three pillars of critical race theory, or the work as defined by Norman Public Schools DEI. You have critical race theory, the ideology, anti-racism, the ideology in policy, and then divisions or offices of diversity, equity, and inclusion, which is the institu institutional enforcement of ideology and policy. They are the divisions of ideological enforcement. And their entire job is to inform redistributive 
discriminatory policies. To moralize racial discrimination in the name of creating equity. That's illegal. And every single official that is supporting this and promoting it is violating the Civil Rights Act. Every single one of you. And every single one of the politicians, like Jacob Rosencrantz, who insists that this isn't in your schools, is not only lying to you, but they are promoting a violation of federal law. And I'm going to tell you right now, this is more ingrained into your schools than you have any idea. Ask your teachers how many times they've had to walk around the school and see what's on the walls in terms of what's promoting equity and what isn't. Equity requires discrimination on the front end of a policy. That's the only way to ensure that discrimination will create equity. So, that's my first podcast here, Norman, Oklahoma. And I hope that you're listening and looking, and that you keep a discerning eye towards what's going on in your schools, and actually pay attention. Because we are very, very close from this ideology dismantling our society, the society that over the last 250 years has produced every piece of technology you're listening to right now. They did not exist at all before this society was created because this society was built about in, built around enlightenment rationalism and the neutral principles of constitutional law. And that's what this seeks to destroy. And you won't be the ones that suffer the brunt of it. It will be your children and your grandchildren who didn't grow up in the America you grew up in. I'm going to tell you. We cannot be nice for the sake of being nice. We can't. We have to call this out for what it is. It's racial discrimination, and it's got to stop. We cannot allow this to destroy our country and the lives of our children.